Good to be here. Amen. Are you glad you're in the house of God today? Amen. Good deal. All right. Hey, I just want to give you a little a little thought, and uh, I was I was thinking about it as Pastor was uh, talking to you, and uh, they were talking to you about your giving today, and and uh, you know as as Pastor said, you know I, I've been pastoring now since my forty third year, and started when I was ten. In case you were wondering, Amen. It's a little, this little child preacher it was so cute. All right, but uh, no, not really. I was fifteen. Amen. But. Uh, one of the things that I, I've learned, I'll just share this with you, and maybe it'll help you. I, ho I hope it helps you. Uh, is that inside of every church, uh, your church here, our church in El Paso, Hillsong, any church, any church in the world, uh, there is what what I call three families inside of every church. First one, obviously, is the church family. That's everybody that calls your church their church. Uh, everybody that calls that. Your church, their church, right? It's the church family. And then inside the church family, there's another family. It's the serving family, right? Serving family. It's all the people that are volunteering today in all the different areas. Uh, and, you know, it would be very hard to have church without serving family. How many of you would agree with me? Amen. So we thank God for the, I'm sure a lot of these people up here today are part of the serving family. And then, then there's another family, and that's the giving family. The giving family. Now think with me for a moment. Without the giving family, the other two families don't exist. Right? Because without the giving family, there is no church for the church family to go to. Is that too strong for you on Sunday morning? Right? Uh, you know, as we say at Abundant Living in El Paso, welcome to big boy church. Amen. So... You know, uh, so really, now think with me, right? So without the giving family, without the giving family, there's no service today. There's no 11 o'clock service, no 9 o'clock, no 1 o'clock service. There's no campuses. Come on, talk to me now. This doesn't exist without the giving family. And there's no church for the serving family to serve at without the giving family. Now, when we understand that, then we understand why God said in Malachi to bring all the tithe and offering into the storehouse. All means everyone should be a part of the giving family. Everyone. Now, when we understand that, right, that without the giving family, there's no church family, no serving family, then we understand why the devil fights us over giving. Hmm? He'll fight you over giving. I've been tithing now for 50 years. And, you know, not every month, but several times a year, thought comes into me. Why don't you quit? You've been giving all these years. You give way above your tithe. You know, uh, uh, the last six or seven years, I've been the biggest giver in our church. Not because I make the most money, far from it. But I just give. And I give, here's one more thought, and then we'll get into today's message, right? Luke 6.38, Pastor touched on it this morning, but in Luke 6.38, you know the verse, right? Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed out, shaken together, running over. The word give there, in the, in the original language, if you were standing there the day Jesus said it, this is what you would have heard. Listen to this. He said, give because you believe God has given to you. Wow. It's a great epiphany in your life, isn't it? When you come to that point in your life where, like David in 1 Chronicles 29, you go, uh, you know, we gave today because we believe everything we have, God gave it to us. So I ask you today, do you believe God? all the good in your life comes from God? Well, Jesus said, if I believe that, then my only response is, I give. He said, give because you believe God has given to you. Charles, do you believe God has given to you? Yes. So what's your response? I give. I don't pray about it. I don't think about it. I do it. Amen. Does that all make sense to you today? Amen. All right. Uh, hey, I've got a lot of good stuff to share with you today, but we can only cover one subject. Actually, we covered one and a half right here. All right. But uh, uh, a couple years ago, I put together this uh, unique thing. It's a UBS, and to me, it's pretty unique. And uh, it's pretty cool, and it's, got this, it's shaped like a credit card, and it's got this cool little uh, thing that pops out here. 
And uh, I went through our, my series and I put together, I'm a big teacher on, on enjoying the abundant life that Jesus came to give me. It's what God called me to do. It's what he told me to do on the night I said yes to be in the ministry, uh, was to teach people that. So I've done a lot of teaching on life and life more abundantly and figuring life out and doing life and living life and, you know, choosing life and all that. So I went through and put together this USB with a bunch of what I thought was some of the most powerful teachings I did and the most relevant. And I put them all together. And if you were to, there's like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's like uh, 14 different complete series on this little USB. And if you were to buy them in CD form on our website, it cost you over $600. And uh, so you can get all of the series, right time, right place, guaranteed success, guaranteed failure, some of the series, laws of life, domino effect, burn the white flag, incredible teaching, right? It's incredible. <laughs> it really is. I, I actually, I'm actually turning that into a book. It'll be out like uh, uh, in August. Life that flows like a river. One of my favorite called Against the Wind. So good. Really, really so good teaching. So powerful. Right? And uh, really good. All right? And uh, life that is truly life. And, yeah, it goes on and on. Uh, anyway, you can get it for 30 bucks. Okay? So I hope that will help you in your life. You guys ready to rock and roll? Can we pray real quick? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every person that's here today. I thank you for allowing me to be here and to be a part of this great, church, a church that I've heard so much about and uh, that Bri Pastor Brian and Bobby have spoken of and others have spoken of, and I'm honored to be here today, and I thank you. Now, Lord, speak to us. Speak to us in the next few moments. Speak to us. Lord, we've come here today to worship you. We've come here today to honor you. We've come here today to, to encourage others and to be encouraged by seeing others, and now we ask you to speak to us. Speak to us. By your word and by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, I called uh, your pastor on Friday and asked him, I said, is there anything you want me to focus on? Is there a certain teaching you'd like me to do or help you come alongside you with? Or anything you've heard me do that you'd like me to bring? Because no one knows you all more than they know you all, right? They know you better than anybody. And so... Uh, uh, Pastor said, you know, I want you to do whatever is on your heart. He said, but I began a series on uh, what I would call mental health and dealing with mental health. And when he said that, it just leaped in my heart. And I'll tell you why. Because back at the beginning of this year, we did a series in our church that was revolutionary. And we called it, Are You Okay? Are You Okay? And you may have been wondering or thinking or had thoughts of why. Why, why is our church doing this? Why are we uh, focusing on this? And, and I'm going to come alongside Pastor today and give you some thoughts and some ideas about some things that we discovered. And let me give you some, some statistics that shocked me when I read them. Now, let me say, I, I'm not shocked that people struggle with mental health uh, issues or even mental illness. I'm not shocked with that. I pastor. I, and as a pastor, I do lots of counseling every year, thousands of hours a year of counseling. So I'm aware of issues that people are, are fighting in their lives or in their families. But as we did research, let me give you some statistics that I found shocking. Uh, According to the, to the national statistics, 60 million Americans are living with mental illness right now. 60 million. That's one out of every six Americans. Let me count one, two, three, four, five, six. Staggering. One out of six, right? One out of five have been or are on antidepressants. One out of five. Listen to this, 40,000 people a year in America commit suicide. It's two times the murder rate, double the murder rate. This one really hurts me. Suicide has become the number one killer of people ages 15 to 24 in our country. Number one. So what do we as the church, how do we respond to that? Do we, sad to say, over the last several years, I think a lot of the church has kind of acted like 
It's not there. Or we felt overwhelmed by it. Or we gave little pat answers. Uh, they'll get mad at me now, right? We give these little pat answers, you know. Oh, just snap out of it. Please don't ever tell somebody that. Please don't say that to them. Or here's one, right, that you hear quite often. You know, uh, you have no reason to be depressed. You have no reason to. Yeah, they do. If they didn't, they wouldn't be struggling with it. All right? Then there's this attitude that, that, that people struggle with this in their life because somehow they're weak. You know, mental illness is an illness. We don't tell people that have cancer they're weak. Amen? So we need to change that narrative. How many of you agree with me, right? And I believe that we as believers, we as a local church, that we are what Jesus said in Matthew 5, salt and light. And that we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And God wants us to bring light and the sad thing is, is that many people around us, people in this room with us today, are living with and often hiding a veil of darkness in their hearts and minds. And they are living with anxiety, shame, depression, panic, suicidal tendencies, and oftentimes are afraid or embarrassed to even talk about it. And they shouldn't be. Why are they afraid? Because of judgment. Lack of understanding. We've got to stop judging people. And be salt and light in their world. So I want to share with you some thoughts today and help you. And I'll start off by saying to you that this area is very personal to me because I went through a period of several years of uh, struggles mentally that I never dreamed I would go through. I never imagined that I would go through it. Uh, I know what set it off. Uh, my wife of 42 years uh, on May of 2012, uh, was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer. And on December the 30th of 2012, she went to heaven. And so it was a very short period, and it was very stressful, as, you, as many of you know. You've dealt with that, either personally or someone in your family. And uh, when she passed away, uh, I realized that I was... Uh, have you heard the expression, I was at the end of my rope? I'd gone beyond the end of my rope, but I had no idea that I had. I was physically exhausted, mentally exhausted, spiritually depleted. Uh, on top of that, if I can be so bold as to say, and I don't mean this, and I'm just trying to share with you, uh, I was financially depleted. Uh, what had taken Rochelle and I years to save was all gone, and... So I was really in a spot of starting over. And uh, I began to experience for the first time in my life panic attacks. I would come out of my bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. I couldn't breathe. Uh, I'd never had that before. I, I began to experience uh, uh, memory loss, uh, lack of focus. I live in a gated community, and, and I would pull up to the gate to punch in the code, and I couldn't remember it. And I would literally sit there, and, and the longer I sat there, the more afraid I got. Does that make sense to you? And, and uh, I couldn't sleep. Uh, I was uh, having chest pains. I was uh, struggling. Uh, I developed gastritis uh, from stress. All of these are things that I never dreamed would happen to me. As I said, I'm a Texas alpha male. We don't go through this. But I was. And, and I began to think that my life was basically, uh, I wasn't going to end well. I, I did not have suicidal tendencies, but I did have anxiety, depression. 
Uh, there were days when I didn't want to leave my house. I wanted just to stay in bed and not get up. A part of that was because I wasn't sleeping at night. Uh, but other parts of it was it was just easier to stay home, if that makes sense to you. Uh, I was embarrassed. <laughs> I was ashamed. I dealt with a lot of regret. Not regret because I didn't have a good marriage. I had a very good marriage. But when some of you know what I'm talking about. When, when you lose that person, uh, it's amazing the, the, the minute details that you remember of things that you could have done better, should have done better, ought to have done better. And why did I say that? What an idiot I was to respond that way. Why didn't I take that moment? And things that when you're living with them, you don't pay that much attention to. But when you lose them, wow, regret. Does anybody know what I'm talking about today? It's just it's overwhelming. And I tend to be, uh, I tend to be uh, very self-judgmental. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been bothered by criticisms of people in my community. But can I be honest with you today and tell you that that their criticisms of me are nothing compared to my self-judgment. Okay? And so, you know, yeah, for whatever that's worth. Okay? And so uh, I found that to be a great strength. But you know, your great strength can also become your greatest weakness if you're not careful. Right? It can turn around and bite you in the pew warmer. Okay? <laughs> and so I really began to struggle and really... Uh, fought through it. And I wanted to tell you today that I fought through it because of a couple things. Number one, all right, that I'll share with you in a moment. Number two was my friends. Absolutely. Oh. I had a couple guys in my life, actually about four or five of them, that wouldn't let me go. They would not let me go. Um, one of them was my pastor, Tommy Barnett. Uh, would not let me go. He called me every day. Every day. I want you to think about that. Every day. Called me every day. Made time to contact me. Another friend of mine, another pastor named Don K. Wood, you wouldn't know him. Uh, he called me every day. Sometimes he called me two or three times a day. My doctor, who's a friend of mine and a Christian guy, called me every day. And I had some other guys that called me three or four times a week. And they didn't judge me. They loved me. They encouraged me. They rebuked me at times in a loving way. Uh, but they stood with me. They prayed with me. They believed in me. And they didn't let me go. And I'm convinced one of the reasons why I'm here today is because of that. They would call me and say to me, are you okay? They, please hear me now, they didn't assume that I was okay because I'm Charles Neiman. Right? They didn't assume, well, he knows the word better than we do. They reached out to me. They were there with me on my good days and they were there with me on my lousy days. And, uh, and they wouldn't make fun of me or cut me off or be distracted. Uh, they would speak the word to me and other times they would just let me cry. And they didn't give up on me. So this is a very personal teaching to me. And I was so glad when we as a church team, my son and my daughter and I, decided to address this and bring it out into the open and and we brought in therapists and we brought in people to speak to our church and, and, uh, and things. Listen, if you're here today and you're struggling with mental health issues, you know, get help. Get help. Don't suffer at home. Get help. Get therapy. Get counseling. Get in a connect group. Come to celebrate recovery. Get in church. Do the things. Don't suffer in silence. Don't suffer in silence. And if you have someone close to you that's struggling, please don't be judgmental. Please don't be cliche-ish. Please don't 
uh, just blow them off. Please don't just throw a Christian cliche on them, you know. Uh, be salt and light in their world. Does that make sense to you today, right? And come along beside them and put your arm around them or put your arm together or just call them on the phone or check on them. But, but demand that they get help and be an agent of health and cure. Jeremiah said, God said in Jeremiah, I will bring you health and cure. Listen, I want to tell you today, if you're struggling with, with anxiety or PTSD, you know, my doctor finally diagnosed me as having a form of PTSD. And I was embarrassed because I've got guys in my church that have been to Iraq and Afghanistan nine times, 10 times. I've got a guy, a friend of mine in my church, he was a Marine recon guy. And one day out on patrol, uh, he saw two Humvees in front of him get blown up and he lost 22 of his friends in one day. In one day, 22 of his friends gone right in front of him. And so we've had a lot of time working with him and, and he's doing really well. And he married a great girl and he's, he's you know, he's, <laughs> he's still a Marine, but you know, he's a little, <laughs> little rough around the edges and, I don't introduce him to everybody that comes to church, amen. Because there ain't no telling what's going to come out of that mouth sometimes. But we love him and he loves us. And, and uh, if anybody's really ugly to me, he'll get rid of them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he really will, okay. But I don't let him. I want to be clear about that. Uh, so many people, family, friends, co-workers are living with or are often heading in the direction of darkness in their hearts and their minds. And we as church need to realize that God cares about all that and wants them well. Third John 2, I pray above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. There's a direct connection to mental health and physical health and prosperity in life in general. Can we all give a good amen to that? So this is a real world and we need to deal with it. And the other thing that I want to get into right now is that uh, is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So if you have your Bible there, you can look at I think they're going to put it up on the screen. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Have we got it? Yeah. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Anybody here today in the flesh? No, I'm not in the flesh. Yeah, you are. You're sitting here. What do you want? What, what, what do you think you're sitting in? Amen? You super spiritual Christian. You know. Well, I'm not in the flesh. Yeah, you are. <laughs> well, though we walk in the flesh, we're not war after the flesh. Well, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Look at that. Strongholds. Right? Strongholds. Now, for years, I was taught that strongholds were like over cities, over countries, and I guess they are, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about strongholds in our minds, in our minds. Those are the most dangerous strongholds you'll ever have in your life. Now, write this down if you're taking notes. We think we think of strongholds, we think of bad ones, but you can also have good ones. Okay, and you can replace a bad one with a good one. But you know what happened to me when I went through that period? I replaced some good ones with bad ones. And I also allowed some bad ones to be built alongside the good ones. Kind of like a city, right? You know, when you look at a city, when I was flying in early this morning, I was looking out over your beautiful city. And like your city, like, like yours is prettier than mine, but as it drove, well, it is, amen. I mean, mine's been good to me, but yours is prettier, Okay. I don't think anybody would argue over that, right? And so, uh, you know, we have beach. We have no water, but we got beach. <laughs> we got hundreds of miles of beach in any way you look. It's called desert, okay? <laughs> we got beach. No water, but beach. We don't have trees. Unless you plant them and fertilize them and water them forever, then you'll get a little, you'll get a tree. So, uh but, you know, in the city, you know, you've got beautiful buildings and you've got other buildings that aren't so beautiful, right? They grow up right next to each other. Same thing's true with strongholds in your mind. You've got good ones, you've got bad ones. Okay? 
put it back up again, please. Thank you. All right. So pulling down of strongholds. Now watch. He's going to reveal to you how strongholds are built. It's an incredibly valuable piece of scripture. Incredibly valuable. Watch. He's going to do it from, from top to foundation. Okay. Look at it. Casting down imaginations. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So strongholds, good or bad, start with thoughts. Thoughts. Now the researchers tell us that we think somewhere between forty to 60,000 thoughts a day. Now I don't know who counted that. Whether they got a little clicker, you know, walk around? I don't know. Right? I mean, guys get paid to research that, or they just say, ah, let's put forty to 60,000. They'll never know. Amen. <laughs> But anyway, that's all we know, so we go with it, right? Now, needless to say, most of those thoughts we're not even conscious of, okay? But every once in a while, a thought gets what I call traction. And we begin to meditate upon it. We can begin to consider it. Now, at that moment, if it's going negative, it does what the verse says. It then exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And that's what began to happen to me. Right? These thoughts of fear, these thoughts of anxiety, these thoughts of I'm getting dementia, these thoughts of maybe I've got insomnia, I've got, uh, uh, what's the other one called? <laughs> Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, I'm losing my mind. I began to think that, right? I mean, I'm sitting there at the pad looking at the keypad, and I can't remember the code to my own house. I got to wait till somebody comes up and hits a remote or something so I can go into my own house. What? It's crazy. I, I couldn't remember verses. I, I, I couldn't remember. I'd go places. I'd go to Target and didn't know why I was at Target. I, I didn't know why. You know, I'd lay in bed for hours and hours and hours at night. I'd sleep two or three hours, maybe, at night, day after day after day after day after day. And finally, my doctor put me on uh, uh, sleeping aids. And it, the kind that are non-addictive, yeah, right. Yeah, do that for six or nine months and then go a night without one and see if it's non-addictive. Okay? The panic would come. Oh, my God, I'm out. I, I, don't, I don't have it. I, I, I don't have my ambient. Oh, my God. Now, this is my experience. Maybe it's not everybody's, but it was mine. Right? And so... Um, you know, I began struggling with all that. And it all began with a thought. And then that thought exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Now, the knowledge of God is God's promise to you. A promise of health and cure. A promise that you can get better. A promise that you don't have to live this way. Okay? Now, let me help, help you. Is this making sense to you today? Now, my issue in my life was, is the same issue that everybody's is. And that, that's, that is this. You can mentally assent to the truth of God's word. You can mentally assent to the truth of God's word. But it's another thing to believe it and see it manifested in your life, right? And so I found myself, and I'm the guy that teaches that. I'm known for teaching that around the world, okay? But I found myself in that trap. And, and, and I found in my life that it was a culmination of things. I was physically tired. I was mentally exhausted. I was emotionally depleted. And I was financially drained. And so everywhere I looked, I just saw barrenness. Does that make sense to you? And then, you know, at 60, uh, what was I then, at 63 years old, right, I was thinking, oh, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm alone. And, you know, I didn't want to come home at night. And I, I would stay at the office till 7 or 8 o'clock at night because I didn't, I didn't want to come home. Uh, it sucked. And, uh, you know, and so I thought, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to man up and I'm going to toughen up Buttercup and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk this out. And uh, thank God I didn't have to walk it out because uh, two years ago, God brought me a beautiful wife named Lynn, who uh, South African. And uh, so, yeah, God's wonderful. Uh, so back 
to my point, right? So thoughts and imaginations can take over your life. Anybody know what I'm talking about today, right? So these thoughts, can you put it back up for me again? Thank you, right? So these thoughts become a high thing, and then that high thing becomes an imagination, or as the literal Greek text says, a reasoning. Now, we know that reasoning produces conduct. You reason a thing, and then you, then you make a choice. You make a decision. You act a certain way, right? You reason it. Huh? You reason it. I watch a TV show every Friday and Saturday night called Live PD. Right? That's wonderful. I'm like, like a part of Live PD Nation. Amen. And so I watch it every week. And every week you'll see at least three or four times on the show where somebody goes, what was he thinking? Right? You ever heard that? What was, what? You know, you actually thought you could outrun that German shepherd? Ain't going to happen, Bubba. Right? Not going to happen. He going to catch you and he going to bite a chunk out of your leg. Right? But every week there's a guy that tries. Okay? Now, what's my point? My point is, is that somewhere in his brain, that made sense. <laughs> Began with a thought. As crazy as it sounds, it was a thought. I'm going to run, right? <laughs> Began as a thought that became a high thing because the high thing and exalts self against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is, Bubba, put your hands up and get on your knees. You ain't out running that dog, <laughs> right? Is this too simple? But it exalted itself and says, you can outrun it. Then it became a reasoning, an imagination. He saw himself getting away. It's going to make sense. Go on, dog. <laughs> hmm? Now, we're laughing at that, and it is kind of funny, but it spreads over into other areas, right, very quickly, right? You see, see what I'm saying to you, okay? So if I'm going to tear down a stronghold, what do I have to do, right? The same, same thing they do when they blow up a building, Right? What do you do? You study the blueprints and you find out how the building was built. When you find out how the building was built, then you can bring the building down. And the way that that negative stronghold gets built in your life is with a thought. So I, got to, I had to go back to the thought. And I had to challenge the thought. Does that make sense to you? I had to bring it into captivity, right? It's what he said for me to do, in, into the obedience of Christ or into the obedience of the Word of God. So I had to replace the negative thought with a God thought, with a positive thought, with a health and cure thought, with a, an abundant life thought, with a thought that God wants. What, you know, in the night Jesus was born, what did the angels say? Peace on earth. Right? They weren't saying peace among us. They were saying you and I can have peace. First of all, with God, and then God from God to us. And, you know, the word peace in the Hebrew and the Greek means health welfare, prosperity, and every kind of good. Did you know that? Health, welfare. So when Jesus said, my peace I give unto you, he was saying, my health I give you. My welfare I give you. My prosperity I give you. And every kind of good I give you. That's my will for your life. That you have peace. Isn't that beautiful? All right. So then I began to embrace, you know what? I don't have to live this way. I'm not losing my mind. These are thoughts, and my mind is under attack. And all of us, our minds are under attack. Whether you have mental health issues or not, your mind is under attack. Can we agree on that? Right? Our minds are under attack. There's so much stuff coming at us contrary to the word and the will of God. Right? Is he coming up here to play the piano? That means I'm, <laughs> that means I'm almost out of time, huh? Okay. Ign Act like he's not there. <laughs> Amen. I'm having fun with you, bro. Still love me? Okay. <laughs> Amen. All right. So let, let me show you this here, right? So it says, right, so I had to replace that. I had to replace that. I had to replace that. I had to get down to the foundation. The foundation was the thought. So I had to replace that thought. I had to deal with it. I had to attack it. I had to get after it, right? Replace it, right? And then that thought then... Right? 
began, then that new thought began to exalt itself, not against the knowledge of God, but in harmony with the knowledge of God. And then that began to create new reasonings or new imaginations. Now I got a stronghold. I got a new stronghold. Got a health stronghold. Got a prosperity stronghold. Got a peace stronghold. Got a, wow, I'm going to go to sleep stronghold tonight. Right? I've got a God has forgiven me stronghold. Right? I've got a stronghold of not only does God heal, God restores. So I started believing, maybe this will help you, I started believing on the Sermon, I'm not Sermon on the Mount, on the day of Pentecost when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, he made a lot of marvelous statements. You can read them there in Acts, the second and third chapter. But one of the most remarkable things that Peter said was, is he said, in the, from the time Jesus came the first time, listen to this, from the time Jesus came the first time until he comes the second time, get ready, you're going to love this, Peter said, everything that can be restored will be restored. So in the New Testament, we are promised restoration. Now, I did not, what I learned when I started believing for restoration, I didn't define restoration. I told God to define it. I said, I trust you. I trust you to bring your promise to pass. And I started believing in restoration instead of devastation, if I can say that to you, right? I started believing in restoration because I got a new stronghold. Okay? Now, here's the last thought, right? All of this came from a statement my pastor made to me decades ago, and it revolutionized my life. I use it all the time. My family uses it all the time. It's a big part of who we are as a church family, if you were in El Paso. And it's this. It's your mind. You can put it where you want. Let me say that to you again. It's your mind. You can put it where you want. Okay, real quick. Still with me? I have a minute and 50 seconds. Okay? When my doctor told me that he diagnosed me with PTSD. And I argued with him. So he said, okay, I'm on the national website. I'm going to read the symptoms. You stop me when one of them doesn't fit you. It was like, man, I am screwed up. <laughs> I remember thinking that. I was like, oh, I'm screwed up, you know? Hallelujah. Oh, I was like, his name is Mitch. I said, wow, Mitch, I'm really glad you called me today. Right? I'm serious. I'm just being honest with you, right? And then he said, I said, so what do we do? And this is what he said. He said, well, there's two ways we can go about this. I said, okay. He said, the first one is, he said, I'll give you a prescription. He said, they're pretty good. It takes us a while to get it balanced in your life, but they're pretty good. I said, okay. And I'm not anti-medicine. I'm pro-medicine. So I said, Okay. And, uh, and then, he, and then he, I said, are there side effects? He said, yeah, there are some. He said, but he said, Charles, you got side effects now from not taking it. <laughs> Couldn't argue with that. <laughs> Amen, right? It's called screwed up, right? That's how I interpreted it, right? Please don't take that personal. I'm talking about me, right? That's how I interpret it. And then he said, and I said, so what second way? And this is what he said to me. He said, well, he said, I guess you practice what you preach. Now, that was liberating to me. And you need friends like that. I do. I need friends that treat me like a big boy. And so he said, you know, you practice what you preach. And at that moment, and I'm sharing that with you to share this truth with you. This was my experience. It doesn't fit everybody. Everybody understand that? This is not a blanket, but I think the truth is a blanket statement. And this is what I realized. Maybe it'll help you. And out of my mouth, I said this. I went, wow. And I had this warm sense kind of flow over me. And I said, wow, Mitch. And he said, what, 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 what do you mean? He said, a moment ago, you were kind of fighting with me. He said, but I sense a change in our conversation. I said, yeah. I said, because I realize I'm not going crazy. 
I'm under attack. It's and and I and I said, Mitch, it's my mind, didn't it? And he said, Yeah, it is. I said, and I can put it wherever I want, can't I? And he said, Yeah, you can. I said, So you know what? I'm gonna quit putting my mind over there and I'm gonna move it over here. Now it took me a few months to do it, but I started that day. And if I can do it, you can do it. It's your mind. It's your mind. You can move it. You can move it. I've shared that with my friend, Sean, the Marine Recon guy. I said, Sean, you don't have to lay in bed at night and keep seeing that over and over again. It's your mind. Put it over here. And I said, you've got to quit feeling guilty because you came home. I had to quit feeling guilty because I was still here and Rochelle wasn't. I don't know why I'm still here, but I am. So that means God still has a hope in the future for me. He has a hope in the future for you. Stand to your feet with me, please. Does that make sense to you? Right? In Matthew 6, Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. The word thought there means don't be anxious. Look at that, anxiety. Jesus addressed it. That anxiety, that panic, huh? Can we pray? Lift your hands towards heaven. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for this time together today. I thank you for this amazing congregation, Lord. They've let me be so honest and open today. And I pray that though I may have said things about how I describe myself, I, I hope people understand I wasn't describing them. I pray for everyone here today, Father. I know there are people here very possibly people here today struggling with mental health issues. They're struggling with it. And I pray today, Lord, that they won't suffer in silence and that those around us will not walk past them with blinders on, but that we'll turn around and say, are you okay? I would rather ask and them say I'm fine than to ignore. And we'll be honest and truthful. And get help. Get help. Come to church. But also get help. Counseling, therapy, medicine, whatever, whatever, whatever. Celebrate recovery. Whatever we need to do, Father, I pray today that you will help us and that we if we have friends or co-workers or family that's struggling Lord may we put our arms around them can I hear good amen today and care about them and open up and and walk along beside them like my friends did and like I'm trying to do now with other friends that are struggling that are fighting the good fight we believe for that today Father help us Help us. I pray for those that are struggling personally, Lord, and I pray for them. I pray that you bring them health and cure. I pray that, that, that light will come into that darkness, and that light, though it's small, will get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it'll drive out the darkness in their life. May they see you, Jesus, as their stand-up and their recovery. Their stand-up and their recovery. In Jesus' name, amen. Beautiful. Can I, uh, can I, do I have time to, okay. Can I have every head bowed and every eye closed? This, this is not going to take a long time, but I'm not going to rush it either. Maybe you're here today, and I want to ask you a couple of thoughts, give you a couple of things to consider. Number one, did you know that Jesus came to live in you? Do you know that Jesus came to, bring you forgiveness for every sin that you've ever committed or will commit? Oh my gosh, is that good news? No, that's not good news, that's great news. And He wants to do that in your life because He loves you. And that's almost become a cliche, Jesus loves you, this I know. But the fact is Jesus loves you and He wants you to know that in a real way, not in a theoretical way, in a real way. All of us need a Savior. Why? Because we've all sinned. Plain and simple, blunt fact, 
That's a fact. We all know it. And because we've all sinned, we all need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. And He wants to save you today and make you a child of God. And He does that by you opening up your heart and receiving Him into your life, the Bible says, as your Lord and your Savior. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to let us pray with you today. You won't be singled out. You're not going to come to the front. You're not going to have to talk in the mic. We'll pray with you right where you stand and Jesus will come into your life. Or maybe you would say to me today, Pastor, I don't know what I need. I just feel far away from God. I feel distant. I feel a disconnect. Would you pray with me? Of course I will. Or maybe you'd say, Pastor, at one time I knew God good, but I got away. Can I come back? Yeah, you can. You ever heard the story of the prodigal? You can come back. So this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to lead everyone in a prayer. And if you're going to pray with me today, A, to become a child of God, B, to get closer to God, C, to come back, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand at the count of three. One, two, three. Raise your hand right now. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my gosh. So many hands. Thank you so much. That's so, spe so special, so beautiful. Can I lead you in a prayer? I want all of you to raise your hands and everybody else pray along with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I choose you. Come into my life. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Come live in me. Be Lord and Savior of my life. I put you now on the throne of my heart. Be Lord here. Teach me how to live. Shine your light on my path. Make yourself known to me. I want to feel your presence. I want to taste and see that the Lord is good. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you. Love you. Thank you, Pastor.